Lord, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be now and always acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I wonder if anyone has ever had an argument with someone over a difference of opinion. <clears throat> or, more to the point, I wonder if there's anybody here who's never quarrelled over different opinions. In his autobiography, the philosopher Bernard Russell describes a time when he and his wife had to make a difficult decision. Whatever was decided, looking back after many years, he wrote, I still think I was right. <laughs> and she still thinks she was right. It's easy to think that we are right and to look down on people who disagree with us. Are any of these pictures, any of the attitudes in these pictures familiar? We may have our own opinions about a range of things and can often discount others with a different view. But what difference does trusting in Jesus as Lord make to our attitudes to fellow believers with different opinions? Remember what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 9. If you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So trusting in Jesus as Lord makes every believer one of God's people now and assures us of being justified, forgiven and unashamed when Jesus returns. And Paul's moved on in the book of Romans and he now points out that trusting in Jesus as Lord transforms our attitudes to fellow believers with whom we disagree on matters of opinion. We heard the first part of this, uh, the reading this morning from Romans 14, 1 to 12, but it goes on to chapter 15, verse 6, which is worth reading if you have time this afternoon. Two particular practical issues were ma matters of contention in the small house churches in Rome. They were largely composed of Gentiles with some believing Jews, who, you may remember, had not long ago returned to Rome after being banished by the Emperor Claudius. And they had different opinions about what to eat and what days to observe. Some people believed in eating anything, while others would only eat vegetables. Some observed certain days, while others considered all days to be the same. Millions of people in the world today are vegetarians for a variety of reasons. But the reason some followers of Jesus in Rome became vegetarians was because they couldn't be sure of getting the right sort of meat. Had it been offered as a sacrifice to idols before being sold at the market? How could you guarantee that the meat had been prepared according to the kosher laws? So some believers, out of conscience, preferred to stick to a vegetarian diet, avoiding meat altogether. Others were happy to eat meat knowing that idols were nothing and the whole world belonged to the Lord, including every piece of meat. After all, hadn't Jesus himself taught that all foods were now clean? As important as regulations about food and special days had once been, it was now faith in Jesus as Lord that marked them out as God's people. So Paul begins... Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarrelling over opinions. No matter what your opinion on these matters is, you are to welcome and embrace, not simply tolerate, believers with whom you differ. And do not quarrel about things that are just a difference of opinion, as one translation puts it. Another says, don't criticise them for having beliefs that are different from yours or don't quarrel over disputable matters. Who is Paul referring to as weak, weak in faith? Some believe in eating anything, other the weak only eat vegetables. This certainly doesn't mean their faith in Jesus as Lord is weak. 
It's just that they haven't fully worked out all the implications of believing in God as creator and Jesus as the crucified and risen Lord. They have a sensitive conscience and aren't fully convinced in their own minds about eating meat. Maybe some believers from a Jewish background who'd been careful all their lives can't imagine eating pork, the cheapest and readily, most readily available meat. Maybe like someone brought up not to eat meat on Fridays, finding it hard to change the habit. Others from a Gentile background might have been so involved in the pagan rituals and animal sacrifices that they can't stomach the idea of meat at all. Maybe like someone who's been an alcoholic, being highly sensitive to all forms of alcohol. Such people must be welcomed. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain. Those who abstain might not, must not pass judgment on those who eat. And later we're asked in verse 10, why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or why, or you, why do you despise your brother and sister or sister? It's so easy to discount or judge or despise someone with whom we differ. No wonder Jesus warned his followers about not setting themselves up as judges of another. So easy to do. Imagine a follower of Jesus with a strict conscience. His background, upbringing and temperament make him take his responsibilities very seriously. Because of its association with all sorts of immorality in the pagan temples, he would never think of eating meat. One day at the market, he notices a woman he knows to be a follower of Jesus buying meat, which obviously came from a pagan temple. How disgusting, he thinks. How could she? She's compromising with idolatry and immorality. She deserves condemnation. The believing woman, however, has come to understand that the one true God is the creator and redeemer of all things. The whole world belongs to God, including every piece of meat you might ever buy or cook. She knows perfectly well that she's called to a lifestyle very different from that of the pagan world around. But she also knows that belonging to Jesus' kingdom isn't about what you eat or don't eat. What you need is to be transformed by the renewal of your mind, as Paul wrote earlier in Romans. So she thinks, I get tired of being condemned and criticised by people who don't seem to understand. They are so narrow-minded and unenlightened. I despise them. Judging and despising, both natural reactions. And Paul urges his readers and all of us who trust in Jesus as Lord to be transformed in our attitudes to fellow believers with different opinions on such matters. We need to allow each other freedom of conscience on issues like these. We're not to quarrel over things that are matters of opinion, disputable or non-essential matters where there's no clear teaching in the Bible. Things that have been called adiaphora. Think of some of the sorts of things that Christians argue over. Music, traditional or modern. Drinking or abstaining from alcohol. Shopping on Sunday. Infant or adult baptism. Forms of worship, liturgical or free. Different Bible translations. People, some people in America argue about which Bible translation you absolutely must use. Uh, voting in the referendum. Maybe even women's ordination, though I hate to say it. But people are convinced one way or another from their understanding of scripture and we're not to condemn or write off others with a different view. Issues like these need careful and reasoned thought and Paul urges that everyone must be fully convinced in their own minds. The most important and most challenging thing is our attitude to others who've not come to the same decisions on such subjects. Trusting in Jesus as Lord 
transforms our attitudes to fellow believers with whom we disagree on matters of opinion. Jesus is Lord. Did you notice in the readings how many times the Lord, Christ or God is mentioned in this reading? I counted 15 times in 12 verses. When it comes to different opinions about matters like this, Paul reminds us of four important truths for those who trust in Jesus as Lord. First of all, we're all serving the same Lord. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain. Those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. And then who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It's before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. We're to welcome believers with whom we disagree because God has welcomed them, forgiven them, and embraced them in his love just as he has us. We all belong to the same Lord as we've put our faith in him. We're all serving the same Lord. Imagine bursting into someone's house to condemn one of the, the owner's servants. Who do you think you are? What's the way they serve their master got to do with you? You're not their judge. The master of the house is the one before whom they stand or fall. Here, the Lord himself. And guess what? They will be upheld, justified, declared to be in the right, because the Lord is the one who is able to make them stand. Let's think again when we're ready to pass judgment on a servant of the Lord over something that's a matter of opinion. We're all serving the same Lord. And we all give thanks and honour to the Lord. Some judge one day better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honour of the Lord. Those who eat, in honour of the Lord since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain in honour of the Lord and give thanks to God. It wasn't just food that was a bone of contention. Jesus' followers in Rome were divided on which days were to be observed. Some believed that they should keep the major Jewish festivals, including the Sabbath, though Christians now met on Sunday, the first day of the week, celebrating Jesus' victory over death in his resurrection. Others believe that every single day God gave us was one for which to give thanks and honour to God. For Paul, this was a matter of indifference. But whatever decision you made about food or days, you should be fully convinced in your own mind and do it in honour of the Lord, giving thanks to God. Some Christians today don't celebrate Christmas because of its association with pagan origins and some contemporary practices. But others of us are very happy to celebrate Christmas with its full Christian meaning. Let's not set ourselves up as judges on matters like this as we all give thanks and honour to the Lord. Thirdly, our whole lives are bound up with the Lord. We don't live to ourselves, we don't die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. We're all following the one Lord. It's before the Lord alone that every Christian lives and dies, stands and falls. Our whole lives from beginning to end belong to him. Christ died and return to life again so that he might be supreme over every realm, the living and the dead, this world and the world to come. Jesus is ruler over everything in heaven, on earth and under the earth. If Jesus reigns, he reigns over vegetables and meat and over every day of the year. Rather than arguing about the wrongness or rightness of minuscule matters, Let's live out our convictions in a way that makes clear that Jesus has preeminence. Disputes about food and days need to be seen within the wider perspective of God's purposes set forth in Jesus. That's why Jesus lived and died and then lived again, so that he could be our master 
across the entire range of life and death and free us from the petty tyrannies of each other. That's the way the message translates it. And fourthly, we are all accountable to the Lord, to God. Why do you pass judgment on your brother and sister? Why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will be accountable to God. Judging each other on disputable matters is simply wrong because the right to judge belongs to God alone. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Despise your brother or sister. They are brothers and sisters and each has a place in the Messiah's family and all are accountable to God. On matters of secondary importance, believers should refrain from denigrating remarks and instead refer to divine judgment. God is the one who will judge the behaviour of his subjects. And Paul backs this up with a quotation from Isaiah 45. As I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me, every tongue shall give praise to God. In the final judgment, when Jesus returns, the fruit of believers' lives with their choices and convictions will be given either praise or disapproval. For believers, the final judgment is not an investigation into whether they are a Christian, but an evaluation of how they lived as a Christian. The fact that everyone will give an account for themselves leaves no room for despising and judging others. Trusting in Jesus transforms our attitudes to fellow believers with whom we disagree on matters of opinion. But are there matters on which we are not at liberty to have different opinions? I'm sure some of you are thinking that as we go through this. Tom Wright gives some rather extreme examples to help us think about this. Supposing a Christian were to say, I know the Old Testament tells us not to steal, but Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3 that all things are yours. And I think that means we should be free to help ourselves to anything we want. I know some people still have a tender conscience about such things, and I respect that. But I hope they will respect me too. I won't despise them for their small-minded legalism if they won't condemn me for my liberty in the gospel. I think most of us would be able to answer such a person and at the heart of our answer would be that, that the comment that stealing, be the comment that stealing or not stealing is not one of the things about which Christians can legitimately differ. It's forbidden. The Old Testament prohibition is powerfully reinforced in the new. On the other hand, supposing a Christian were to read the book of Leviticus and to discover there a clear command forbidding the wearing of clothes made from two different kinds of material. Someone with a tender conscience might feel morally obliged to go through their whole wardrobe sorting out clothes made from one material only and throwing all the others away. We might even suppose, as this is an extreme example, that the person then began a protest movement, organising pickets outside shops that sold the wrong kinds of clothes and encouraging Christian friends to join in as a witness to biblical morality. We can imagine the attitudes not only of non-Christians looking on, but of Christians of virtually every kind. Why are you making such a fuss about that? Surely God isn't concerned about the fact that the shirt I'm wearing is made from polyester and cotton. Did Jesus or Paul or any of the other early Christians say anything about such a trivial matter? Get a life. I'm sure we'd agree that stealing is not a matter about which we can say some of us believe this, some believe that, so we mustn't condemn or despise one another. In the second example, we'd almost all want to say that mixing fabrics in clothes is a matter of complete indifference. 
But how can you tell? How do we know which issues come into which category? Actually, this passage in Romans can, tells us a lot about matters which we cannot, on which we cannot agree to differ, which are non-negotiable. Jesus died and lived again and is Lord over all. Jesus is Lord and we belong to him, body and soul. It isn't up to us what we do and don't do, it's up to the Lord, the master whom we serve. As his servants, we do what he says, obeying his word revealed to us in the Bible. We do everything in honour of the Lord, in thankfulness to God. We don't live to ourselves, we don't die to ourselves, we belong, body and soul, to the Lord. And we're all accountable to God and will stand before God's judgment seat. These are not matters about which Christians can differ. They are fundamental to our Christian faith and any issue, any particular issue, must be considered in light of these truths. They're, these are things on which we cannot just agree to differ. Many other things, however, <clears throat> are simply matters of opinion. And trusting in Jesus as Lord transforms our attitudes to fellow believers with whom we disagree on matters of opinion. Arguments and quarrelling are widespread today in the media, in parliament, on social media, in homes and on the street. Judgment and even hatred of those with different opinions are rife with name calling, disparagement, abuse, silencing and sometimes even violence. We who belong to Jesus are called to a different way when we disagree. I wonder if our attitudes to and behaviour towards each other might be a powerful statement about the God who's called us and whom we serve. Let's hope so. At the end of the long, his long discussion, we've only looked at the first part of it, Paul ends with a prayer, which I've adapted so that we can say it together. So I invite you to join with me together. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant us to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that together we may, with one voice, Glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.